in our reach has been this five-week journey of, of rediscovering how Jesus brought hope, how He brought peace, how He brought joy and love within our reach and through the story of Christmas. And as we look to learn the implications of that reality for our lives. Now, two weeks ago, we looked at hope, and we looked at how the story and the coming of Jesus was littered and full of hope. And when Jesus shows up on the scene, we see how it inspires hope. And we realize that, that in much uh, of our lives, we long for hope. And that we see the Christmas season, this season of waiting, this season of anticipation, expectation. And we see Jesus as the source of that hope in which we are waiting for. Now last week we looked at the story of Christmas and how it's surrounded by this idea of peace. The prophets, they spoke of peace coming through the person of Jesus. And we see that Jesus shows up just when people feel like they are end, at the end of their rope and they are in deep need of peace. Though we saw that peace is something that we actually don't get to just have thrown on us. It's something we live into. It's something we need to respond to. It's something we need to have our feet guided into. This morning we look at how Christmas, how Advent is this season that celebrates the transformation of joy that comes from Jesus. Now, what singular word would you use to describe Christmas? If you had to answer somebody, just think, what, what word would you use? If you had to describe the season of Christmas, the story of Christmas, in one singular word, what would it be? Anticipation. Oh, anticipation. Anything else? Salvation. And you say love? Love? Fulfillment? Would you say Jesus, family, celebration? Perhaps you'd use some of the words we've already talked about in this series. Christmas is hope. Christmas is peace. Christmas is love. Christian author Ray Pritchard in an online blog post called Christmas Joy writes, if there's a single word that describes what Christmas is all about, it's the little word joy. He goes on to say, Several of our favorite carols mention it. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why your joyous strains prolong? Good Christian men, rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Joyful, all ye nations arise. Join the triumph of the skies. But what is joy? Sure, we sing about joy. We talk about it at Christmas time. We know that it's part of our Christmas. We know we're supposed to have it. We know it's supposed to define our celebrations. But in all reality, joy very few times probably defines our times together because there's family tension, there's loss, there's problems. What is joy? How would you describe the idea of joy? Is it happiness? Is it bliss? Some type of nirvana? Is it the absence of trial and tribulation? What is joy? Do you believe that you have actually experienced true joy? Can you witness that joy has transformed you in some way? If somebody says, have you had joy, what would you tell them? Is it this? Is it that? The dictionary offers two main definitions for the word joy. It's the emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. Keen pleasure or elation. Or it says it's a source of keen pleasure or delight. Something or someone greatly valued or appreciated. Have you felt this kind of joy? Maybe it defines your marriage. Maybe it defines your experience with the birth of a child. Maybe it describes an intimate encounter that you've experienced some point with Jesus or with the Holy Spirit. But have you sensed joy of this matter? More than likely, you have probably aren't sure if you've truly sensed, felt, or experienced joy like this. You aren't sure if you've actually felt transformed by it. Sure, there's times that you've encountered joy. There's times that you've felt joyous. There's times you felt like rejoicing, but transformed by joy? 
while the holidays may have moments that feel joyous, you might actually even struggle to say that Christmas to you is a season of joy. It's a season of joy. But that's how Ray Pritchard describes it. Last year, Katie and I drove up to Ashland, Pennsylvania. And we did something I hadn't done since I was a small kid, and we visited the Pioneer Tunnel in this small coal town. Has anyone ever been there? It's a beautiful little town built around the coal mines that used to inhabit the mountainsides. It's probably only about a 15-minute drive away from Centralia, the, the town that has been burning since the 60s. It's not far from Knobles Amusement Park. And so our family took our in-laws from California up with us, and we rode a coal mine car deep into the mountain where we followed our guide off the coal mine car. And you can see the cars we rode there. There's not much clearance. We got off and we followed our, our leader as he took us into the mountain and we watched as the train then left the tunnel and left us there in the middle of this tunnel, abandoned without a way out. We were left alone in the dark, 1,800 feet straight into the side of a mountain. 900 feet up was the top of the mountain. We were 900 feet under the ground and 1,800 feet into it. We were left alone in the dark. We began to listen to stories of mine workers who had worked this mine and other mines that were in the area. And we kind of started to grow accustomed to the dark as we learned that the miners actually too grew accustomed to the darkness that they dealt with. They went in before the sun rise. They came out after the sun set. And the light began to even feel funny and strange to them. Many of the miners, they said, would begin to bring extra sandwiches and feed the rats that would hang in this mine. And they did so because the, the mine uh, was lonely and these rats brought them joy. But at the same time, they wanted to keep these rats around because they knew that if the rats who wanted to be around with them because they had food would suddenly run for the end of the tunnel. They knew that danger was imminent, that the end was near. If the rats, these creatures of the night, began to run for the light, it meant that collapse was imminent. Some of the people who were with us began to feel kind of iffy as we walked deeper into the coal mine. And they tease you that the last time the timbers of this tunnel were changed were over 100 years ago. And some people began to feel like they were closed in. You could see the people that were struggling with claustrophobia, kind of just feeling a little weird about being that deep into the earth. There were other people that kind of would say stuff like, you know, I wouldn't want to be here alone, but at least I'm here with you. And so they took pride and joy and comfort in the fact that there were others in this situation with them. I didn't really feel bothered either way by being in it because I was enjoying the experience. There was joy in the history. There was something about experiencing this to, to looking towards it. I enjoyed the train ride in. It was a battery-operated car. I enjoyed walking around in the dark. I would have enjoyed feeding a raft if they let me. I felt joy because I didn't let that situation, the darkness that we were in, the cave, the, the aging mine, define me. The darkness was not allowed to define me and what I was experiencing. The Christmas story is one in which people felt abandoned and alone. And suddenly light breaks in and taught them, you are not to allow the darkness to define you. This morning, as we look at how Christmas includes this celebration of the transformational properties of joy that comes with Jesus, as Christmas we find ourselves singing about joy, pretending we have joy. Has anyone ever pretended you had joy when you really didn't? I should have seen a lot more hands than that. I should have said how many of you are pretending that right now. <laughs> Striving to make our gatherings full of joy, we speak the promise of joy in our church services because joy is something we find central to, if not attached or intertwined, to Luke's telling of the biblical story of Christmas. The secret of joy is not letting the darkness define your circumstance not to define you, not to define your context. The first two weeks we looked at Isaiah 9 and looked at various aspects of the prophetic 
foretelling of the coming of Jesus. But I want to focus on just one verse this morning from Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9, 2. And Isaiah prophesies and writes, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Those who had been lost to the dark, those who were stuck in the center of the mine, those who felt alone and abandoned, they were lost no longer, is what Isaiah is talking about. Those who felt like they had nothing to live for, that there was no rescue, that there was no way out of the mine, they suddenly felt the joy of light. And not any light. It wasn't just that someone flickered on a little hope or reminded them of something. They didn't just experience this little flirtation with joy. They sensed a great joy, a great light, a light that dawned and had transformed them. Listen to this again, and you can feel the transformation properties of this passage. The people who are walking in darkness have now seen, they've experienced a great light, and on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. The transformation of darkness is now light. The darkness was no longer allowed to define them. Now Luke, when he writes his story of Christmas, picks up on this idea of a transforming light. In fact, there are two themes when you study Luke 2 and 1, uh, Luke 1 and 2, that are prevalent throughout all of Luke's telling. The story of peace and the story of joy. Luke, who tells us in the beginning of his his letter, his gospel, he says, I've carefully researched this account and the history of the birth of Jesus. He now sets that story and the telling of that story, the narration, the narrative of that in a very countercultural way. In fact, as we know from looking at the realities around the everyday life of God's people at this time, peace and joy, the things Luke has allowed to define his story, were foreign concepts. They're, they were long waited for things, but no one actually believed they would have them. They were countercultural, they were unimaginable. People were walking in the darkness, they had grown accustomed to it. There wasn't a whole much uh, time invested in hoping for anything else. They had resigned to it, they began to be okay with the rats of the night. They were okay and realized that, hey, we're probably stuck like this, there isn't a way out. In our modern day, social and media lives, we seem to kind of love to follow the weddings of princesses and princesses, princes, princes and princesses. We love to follow presidential leaders and their campaigns. We look to these things as a sense of joy or hope, right? When Reagan ran, he ran with this idea that we needed a cowboy to come to uh, D.C., right? We needed financial conservatism. We needed someone to say nope to dope. And then, you know, when we saw Bush run, he began to run on this campaign that brought hope that he would fix the Middle East. And then Obama, what was his campaign? Hope. Right? And, and Trump, he said, I'm going to make America great again. Right? We, as our social media lives, are always looking to celebrities to either bring us joy, to bring joy to our situation, or we look to them, princes and princesses, and we look at their stories and, and their Hollywood happy lives to bring us and encourage us with joy. But these things are just flirtations with joy. They're not transformations of them. In the same way, in the time of Jesus, People were also, not their social media lives, but their lives were in love with watching what celebrities were doing. They wanted to see what the royals were doing. That is where they found their hope, their joy. In the time of Jesus, people found celebrity bursts central to their hope and at the center of their conversations. So when they were walking through the wise markets, they'd be like, hey, you hear uh, Caesar? Yeah, you might have another baby. Coming, right? That was hope for them, right? It's what they focused themselves on. They saw royal births as a sign of transforming life for their situation. Paul T. Father writes on theologian Scott McKnight's blog about this reality in this way. Ancient biographies of great figures such as Alexander the Great and Caesar Augustus use circumstances at birth to predict greatness. Luke, 
as he tells, and we're going to read here in a minute, the story of Christmas. He uses peace and especially joy as a narrative for Jesus' story. Listen in. Luke records that Elizabeth and Zechariah, the cousins of, of Mary, would come and also have a son despite them being middle-aged and barren. And Luke records that the angel tells them that your son, John the Baptist, a forerunner to Jesus, will bring you great joy. He'll bring you great joy. And, and then we see it again later. It says, uh, Luke tells the story of how Mary goes to visit a very pregnant Elizabeth. And it says, soon as I saw you, Luke records Elizabeth saying, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Oh, Luke doesn't stop there. He says, when John the Baptist, the forerunner, was born, it says that neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to the family. And they shared in their Joy. Luke's narrative of this birth of Jesus is full of this word, joy. In fact, it doesn't stop there. It shows up again when Luke tells the account of angels appearing to Jesus at the time of the birth of Jesus. It's in that story that angels, both figuratively and physically, appear to those in the darkness. Those who are feeling alone and those abandoned. Those who are nobodies. They're insignificant. They are overlooked. They are sleeping in the dark of the night. They are man at the system. There is nothing to give them hope. They have been forgotten. They're pretty sure they've lost themselves. They're pretty sure they've lost everything worth hoping for. It's to those people we see Luke tell this story of angels that show up and bust into the night. Here we pick up the story of Christmas, and we see that Luke continues the celebration and the transformation of joy. And the light that transforms us that Isaiah predicted hundreds of years before. A joy that makes the darkness no longer define those that know it. Luke 2, 6 through 12. When they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you great news that will cause great Joy for all of the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. There will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now the story that Luke tells is far from glorious. It's far from anything that we would call joyous. We know the story. Mary and Joseph, they're unable to find a place to rest. Mary's water breaks, she's going into labor, and so they need to find someone to take refuge, and the only thing available to them is this resting spot for animals. With no place to lay the baby as he slept, Mary, needing her rest, pulls over the manger. Joseph probably pulls the straw and the hay from it, and they're forced to use this feeding trough as a bed. This is the climax to the story. The grand finality of Luke's telling. It's in which the narrative joy is set in advance of. And then on the other side of the climax of the story, we see Luke continues the narrative of joy. So joy is predicted. It's going to come with Jesus. And then all of a sudden, this happens. Jesus is born in the ghetto. He's placed in a dirty place. And Luke says, that's joy. That's what I've been telling you about. And let me tell you, there's even more joy to it. Luke tells of angels who visited shepherds in a field nearby. Shepherds who were unimportant and insignificant to this society by any standard. Some historians believe that the sheep that these shepherds would have actually been watching were to be sacrificial sheep. Most likely in this town of David, that, that these sheep would have been used in the temple for sacrifices. Other, other historians have explained them as investments of wealthier people. But this is Luke's story of joy. It's to these unimportant and insignificant people that Luke says the birth of Jesus means great joy for all people. Great joy for all people. It's the narrative of Luke that an angelic announcement of great joy for all people. 
that we find Luke's explanation of this story of Christmas. Luke says the birth of Jesus is such good news that it causes great joy for all people. All the people. It's not just good news for Jews. It's not just good news for those who are looking for a Jewish Messiah. It's good news for everyone. Here, years before, we find that Jesus extends his kingdom to the Gentiles. Years before Pauline church plants are arguing if Gentiles can be in their synagogues or not, we find it's already been proclaimed and foreseen. And Luke's narrative exclusively calls Jesus a Savior for all people who will bring peace on earth. This is the good news that's full of joy. Luke's audience would have grown up in a context that was known as the Hellenized Jew, Jewish area. It's just these people that had kind of succumbed and become mirrors of the Roman Empire around them. They used their language, used their economy. They lived like Romans, but believed like Jews. And so Luke is writing to this, this Hellenized world. That's his audience. And he begins to use their language, playing on their love and their narrative for royal births. Luke paints the reality through the story of Christmas that Jesus is Lord of all. Not Rome, not Caesar, not any other empire or presidential leader, which at the time folklore and legend around the birth of Caesar spoke of the people of this time, uh, spoke to the people of this time as this thing that ushered in peace and hope. So you have Alexander the Great has these rumors around him. His dad, Philip, has these rumors around him. When Caesar is born, there's these rumors around him that, that the birth of these people, when they come into power, there will be peace. There will be hope. And, and you can read Roman historians, and there's great studies of it. And they, and they tell things like, hey, you know, when Caesar was born, or when Alexander was born, or when Philip was born, uh, you know, this burned down, or this earthquake happened. This, this star was here. And History was trying to show that these men were great men and they brought great things to the kingdom. They made Rome great. In fact, Caesar's birth has said to brought peace and hope to Rome. Luke's playing on that narrative when he writes to these Jewish believers who know the culture of Rome, who have become Rome in essence. He's saying, you guys think Rome has peace and joy because of Caesar? I'm telling you, that baby born in a ghetto has brought peace and joy for the whole world. Not just Rome, for the whole world. Luke's storytelling explains to them that actually real peace and joy comes to all people through the birth of Jesus. In fact, Jesus brought peace and joy by giving significance to those who were overlooked by the empire. Yeah, Caesar might have brought peace and joy, but he didn't bring peace and joy to those shepherds in the countryside. Shepherds, poor single mothers, and Nazarites, those were who overlooked and never tasted peace or joy from Caesar, now were the significant players in the Christmas story. However, what I want us to take away from this story is an understanding of that great joy Luke talks about. That great joy that fills our Christmas story our songs, and we hope fills our gatherings. Because of this great joy and good news, the insignificant and overlooked felt significant. They find this reminder of great joy in the midst of their insignificance, their pain, their loneliness. They feel that all of a sudden we are no longer abandoned. We are no longer alone. We have purpose. There is something joyous with us in the darkness. Right? Remember the people that took joy being in the middle of the mind because somebody else was with them in the same situation. All of a sudden, these people overlooked by any other sense of peace and joy were central to the joy Jesus was bringing. They recognized that somebody had joined them in the darkness. The angels had broken in, pushed past through the night, and actually lit it up. The light had transformed their situation. No longer would darkness define them. The word for great and great joy looks like this. It's great. It's an appearance of things. It's abundant. It's violent. It's mighty. It's strong. And the word jar, joy, car there, means that it's gladness. The joy recedes from somebody. The calls are an occasion of joy. The persons who are one, joy. All of a sudden, 
to this little baby, those who were insignificant, those who were alone and abandoned, would no longer let the darkness define them. There's a few takeaways from the story of Christmas that I want us to draw on this morning. You'll find them on the flip side of your bulletin. This is a story that's been narrated with great joy. Great joy that transforms our existence and transforms the darkness around us. It is this announcement that we see Christian author Ray Pritchard say, the story of Christmas can be described as joy. So throughout the story of Christmas, we recognize that Jesus brought joy within our reach. Not just within our reach, but actually within the reach of everyone. To me, to my neighbors, to even my enemies. Joy that is deeper than a perfect economic situation in the empire. It is even more than the empire's absence of pain and war. It is a joy of significant transformation of God's presence to and for the overlooked. Jesus was something these shepherds could touch. He was literally, physically in front of them. They could hold him. They could smell his newborn smell. They could change his diaper. God's presence was literally there in front of them. No darkness would ever define them again. No matter if they felt their situation improved in this life or not. They might not be the next royal leader. They may not be anything other than a shepherd for their whole life. But no longer if their situ- no more did it ca- they care if their situation improved or not. They had seen, touched, smelled, held the source of light. And that transformed them to no longer be defined by the darkness. They had purpose and significance in their pain and their problems. It didn't take away their pain and problems, but they now had joy within their reach that took and brought them significance. It's because of joy that we can celebrate that we are not alone in the darkness. Now think about a time that you have felt loneliness. You might describe the time as cold, painful, anxious, panicky, terribly alone. Maybe a time or a situation of loss that felt you feeling alone or abandoned. Perhaps loneliness is defining your Christmas season now, much more than joy is, even though you're around a lot of people. Perhaps you're here this morning feeling alone and abandoned, even though there is over 100 people around you right now. Suddenly, we're not alone, the story says. The angels of And light shines them and joins them in the night. That is joy. It's something that transforms you and the way you look at your situation. It gave them purpose. It gave them significance in the pain and the problems they were dealing with. And they respond to it by going to the source, to Jesus. The angels say, you can find the light. You can find the thing that you've been waiting for, that sense of joy. And you can go and you can actually see it. It gives them direction. And you know what? That thing you've been waiting for is actually the presence of God. And it is there. You can go to it. It's the source of it. The joy is that they are no longer alone in the darkness. Third, it's because of joy that we celebrate that light has entered the world. These moments that we feel alone, that we feel abandoned, we feel that we are lost in the darkness, you feel there's doubt, there's no hope, there's no inner peace. And in these times, you'll find that we succumb to panic attacks, to avoidance, to addiction, to lying to ourselves and to others. But really in these moments, the one thing that we are looking for is peace and joy in the form of significance and purpose. Let me say that again. In these moments, panic attacks, avoidance, addictions, loneliness, abandonment, we are fighting and longing for peace and joy in the form of purpose and significance. The shepherds were gathered in the dark of night their life, lost their situations, but when light broke through and shone around them, they found that peace and purpose and significance had come to the night. It was that light to which Isaiah had prophesied about hundreds of years before. It's a light that would transform everyone that it shines on and give them purpose in their pain. Lastly, it's because of joy that we get to be lights in our world. Everyone around us, if you haven't noticed, is beginning to look at the story of Christmas. We have radio stations dedicated to nonstop Christmas music. 
Every store we enter in has people looking for presents for Christmas. We have stores that are full of Christmas presents, Christmas trees, Christmas lights. Our restaurants that we frequent are decorated with decorations, with people saying, have a Merry Christmas. We have people who are telling the Christmas story who aren't even sure if they believe it or not. Christmas is transforming the stores and restaurants and shops we frequent. It feels like the whole world is looking for joy. We are the people who should know this source of joy. This should be our time to shine like a light. However, truthfully, our neighbors, our friends, our family are walking in moments in which they feel alone and abandoned. We've been there. We know that feeling. Some of us are there now. And the story of Christmas reminds us of the joy of the presence of God. We know the source of this significant and transforming joy that caused these shepherds to not only celebrate, but to feel like somebody was with them and to respond to it. It reminds us that we need to be the joy, right? The shepherds then run out and tell the whole world. We've seen it. We've seen the source. Those who are literally looking for joy in the form of significance and purpose in this Christmas season are all around us. It's important that we become the light to them. Paul T. Penley writes, Jesus' global plan for peace and joy is rarely the gospel we announce. Too often we settle for a tiny, personalized announcement of inner peace. Or we give up seeing large-scale peace and joy for all people today and relinquish our hopes to an afterlife or an idyllic world to come. I hope these failures on our part are only reflect a misunderstanding of Jesus. Oh, that's covering up. And not our fear to follow him. I hope these failures on our part only reflect a misunderstanding of Jesus and not a fear to follow him. Which is it for you? Do you misunderstand how this joy is to transform you? Or do you have fear of it? I think we struggle to know joy, to announce joy, to be known for our joy because we actually haven't been transformed by it. We've tasted it. We've reenacted it. We've flirted with it. But we haven't been transformed in the way that the prophet Isaiah talked about it. Billy Sunday sermon once said, if you have no joy, there's a leak in your Christianity somewhere. We might even say if you don't have enough joy, you might have a slow leak in your Christianity. Do you feel like you know joy? Feel like you've been transformed by it? Do people know you for your joy? Do they? When people see you, do they know you as a joyous person? When you look in the mirror, do you say, I know. See it on my face. If not, maybe you have a leak somewhere. In this season, let's be reminded of this source of joy. Here, Jesus, his presence brings meaning and purpose to those who were defined and lost through the darkness. Roman, I mean, Psalm 1611, David writes, You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Folks, both you and I, each other, and our neighbors, even our enemies, need to be reminded of this joy this time of the year. David captures this source of joy, doesn't he? You make known to me the path of life. The only way to live, the way, right? That's what we call Jesus. The only way to live, the path of life, that you fill me with joy in your presence. The only way to live, to follow the way, is to realize that the Christmas story brought us the presence. We are no longer defined by the darkness. I invite you to stand with me. I invite you to ask yourself, where are you feeling alone and abandoned in your life? Where are you longing to have a situation transformed by the light of purpose and significance? Do not be afraid of it. Don't avoid that darkness you feel. Look around those around you. Look to those around you to join you in a loneliness. It's only pride that keeps you from experiencing joy and turning to others. As the comes I invite you to surrender the situation to the Lord, to ask Him to transform you. And this situation, 
with the joyful light that the prophet Isaiah talked about. Secondly, as we worship, where is God asking you to be a radiant light of joy to those around you? Christmas reminds us that we are no longer defined by the darkness of the night. There's joy. We can see it. We can hold it. We can touch it. And more importantly, we are to be it to our neighbors. Go today being known as your joy, letting your neighbors know the source.